Um, so this is one of these uh, examples I'm going to talk more later. Um, so there was this 400 patients with this cancer and then uh, there was a surgery the, this um, tumor was uh, removed in the surgery and then this is the and then they were given a one or three year this adju adjuvant imatinib with this medicine taken orally to reduce the probability of reoccurrence. Now this already you can kind of see in the uh, what was the protocol for the experiment that there was this old question that is three year treatment better than one year treatment? So they had just two options and then after this they would recommend that you should give everyone one year or everyone three years. And the new question, more personalized one is then, how long should each specific patient be treated with this medicine? And, and then uh, I show you the analysis I made for this, uh, showing that how we can uh, do this uh, in this case. Uh, so the data wide survival analysis is that we have some uh, time to event data so that there's like in this uh, cancer surgery there's the time of surgery which is then put as it's a zero and then there's a time to the event and it's for some of the patients they will get cancer again so we have an event and we know that how long it took to even occur. Some of the patients, they didn't get cancer when the study ended or for some other reason they got out of the study. Maybe they died because of some other reason. And for those we just know that, uh, so the even time is censored. We know that it didn't happen in this interval. And this kind of data is quite common in lot of these medical studies, whether it's this cancer rec or re recurrence or cardiovascular diseases and so on, uh, we have some time to event. Oops. So the first example, this is now the different from the one versus three year study. Uh, there was 2,500 patients followed after surgery, but it, it, it was the same uh, cancer, just different set of uh, people, and various predictors available. And we want to know then that how uh, these different predictors help us to predict the reoccurrence. This is the old way of doing these uh, analyses. Uh, you can see here's these Kaplan-Meier plots and in each plot there's different colored curves. They start from 100% it's uh, survived and then the percent it's depending on the group so the different colors uh, correspond to different groups. The probability of survival then drops in time. And this old-fashioned way was then that uh, these groups are determined by the researcher, like here there is the uh, tumor size. So dividing the patients based on the tumor size to different groups, having discrete groups. So like here, the blue one uh, from 5 to 10 centimeters. And then plotting these couple of my plots. We have also here the uh, the mitotic count, uh, location of the tumor, and whether the tumor was ruptured. And so this way, they, it was also, of course already possible to see that which covariates affect uh, the risk. 
Um, and then, based on those different coverage, uh, there's these kind of rule-based groupings. Uh, I'll show you a picture later about this rule-based, but saying that, okay, if it's small tumor and small mit uh, mitotic count uh, and it's not ruptured, then you are in a low-risk group. And then if uh, the tumor is bigger and so on, forming small number of uh, different risk groups. But the problem is that then someone had to decide uh, how to form these rules, to form these groups. And it's feasible when you have just like two, three variables maybe. But still it, you have to just make a um, small number of groups. And then these are showing different uh, rule-based systems where you can see that they produce different kind of uh, results. Um, then one way to do the survival analysis is this Cox proportional Hazard's model. Uh, as you can see here, there was this Hazard plots or the survival plots uh, based on kaplan meyer uh, and in this proportional hazard model, we assume that there is some event rate, which we assume that it's same for everyone on, on some level. But then we have additionally this coverage affecting uh, the level of the hazard. So we are assume that the shape is same. And so we can then with this learn uh, at the same time, the effect of uh, several coverage. In the original Cox proportional hazard model, there was no model for the base, baseline hazard because it's same for everyone. It's possible that um, you can cancel it out in computation if you are just interested uh, on these betas and whether these betas are uh, different from zero. Uh, the Cox wrote already in the original paper that it would be useful to have model uh, for the hazard in time. But since he was doing this in 1970s, it wasn't computationally feasible. So now the Gaussian processes uh, provide a nice way to add that part there too. So here's what it looks like if if we don't have a smoothing. So the original Cox proportional hazard model, uh, there the logarithm of the hazard looks like this. Um, and so you can see that it's noisy. And also now there's some cases. So if there's, um, so the time has been discretized into small intervals. And then we look at in each interval, uh, how many patients are still uh, without when, when, when the time interval started, how many uh, were still uh, in the study, and then how many of them did get cancer again in this interval. And of course... Uh, so now there was now the hazard, and now I just take the logarithm of that. Um, and, and of course, here the hazard can be also zero, but if we take log of zero, then we get minus infinity. So actually, there should be also for some of the time intervals, this would be these minus infinities there. Okay, so now we want to add model for this part, but we don't want to necessarily have parametric form for it, so free form, and then this uh, Gaussian process provides this way to do the non-parametric way. Um, so I'm not going to very deep on the Gaussian processes and equations on these. And 
I, but I want you to think of the Gaussian process as a prior for functions. Uh, in the same way as we can use for some unknown parameter, we can use Gaussian distribution as a prior, saying that we assume that, for example, that uh, if the data doesn't say anything else, it's, to, uh, um, it's likely to be close to zero, and it's less likely further away from zero it is. Now with the Gaussian process, we can set the prior for functions. Again, we can say that uh, the prior can be centered on completely flat function, but then the Gaussian process allows also to describe the variation around this flat function. And here are examples of functions sampled from this prior distribution. So we can look at, okay, if we choose this kind of prior for functions, what kind of properties these functions have? And we can see that we may have, diff using different priors, different GPs, we get smooth functions, less smooth, even less smooth functions. And in this case, there's an example where it has both the longer scale features and then shorter scale features. Uh, some of this prior information we have to define, like saying that, okay, we assume these functions are continuous and maybe how many derivatives exist and so on. But of course, the exact smoothness, how smooth they are, we can learn that from the data. Uh, so here's an example of then, uh, there's the gray dots, our data and just a simple regression. You can see that we can pitch to the data nonlinear function. We didn't need to decide the form beforehand and we get uncertainties uh, about the function and then also uncertainty about the uh, actual observations we might see in the future. Yes, another example, not from survival analysis, but showing the flexibility uh, of Gaussian processes. Uh, so this is uh, birthday data from US, uh, so that how many births there are uh, in each day uh, for several years. And then they had some other people had made um, analysis that whether there are more births uh, in Valentine's Day or less births uh, uh, in Halloween. And then I thought that uh, I can do this analysis better with Gaussian processes. Uh, and yes, we can do it better. And you can see that we could um, easily add these different components and learn these different uh, functions having different like smoothnesses, different time scales. Uh, so this is from 1968 to 1988. You can see slow trend. In all these figures, the scale is same, so you can compare the uh, how big these effects are. Uh, related to each other. So slow trend, uh, then there's really small, fast, non-periodic component. Day of week effect is strong, and it, it's also uh, changing in a time so that in the later years the week, uh, uh, day of week effect is stronger, probably because uh, doctors don't want to work during the weekends and a lot of perch are decided uh, these um, artificially started or then the um, circum what's the, the they cut out the baby out, out of the C yeah c-section yeah uh, seasonal effect and then day of year effect 
showing then these special days like New, day, New Year, Valentine's Day, Leap Day, April 1st. Uh, and there's small effect also in, the, in this Valentine's Day and Leap Day and April 1st. Okay, so it shows the, that uh, the flexibility of these Gaussian processes. So the name is the Gaussian process, but it's not just for assuming that everything in our model is Gaussian. Uh, for, for example, when we have count observations, we want to use Poisson model. And the, the parameter of the Poisson model it has to be positive. We can use the link function uh, so that we force it to be positive. And so we have in the latent space, so here for the f, we have the Gaussian process prior. And then through the link function, we get uh, the function uh, to be the parameter for the Poisson model. And still, the actual observation model is now the discrete Poisson uh, observation model. So, okay, uh, back to this uh, Cox proportional Hazard model with added Gaussian process there. So, previously I had, uh, so I've added now here the exp and then the logarithm. So, you can see it now it's uh, the proportional Hazard model in log space, it's sum of two functions. Uh, and now it's, we can assume a piecewise log constant baseline Hazard by partitioning the time axis. And then uh, for these um, values for this in the uh, piecewise terms, we can add then the Gaussian process prior. And so this was the without smoothing. And then this is the smooth baseline Hazard. And now the good point was that we didn't need to predefine the shape for this function, and it can be now nonlinear function. So here's the previously used AFIP risk categorization. I mentioned that it was the rule paste. You can see now these uh, blocks here. So someone decided to where the cut points for the tumor size are and where the cut points for the mitotic count are. And then there's the, the certain number of um, groups. And for comparison then, using Gaussian process, so now we have, in addition of having the function for the Hazard in time, there's a nonlinear function how the tumor size and mitotic count affect uh, the, this um, hazard. And you can see that uh, from the shape that there are nonlinear effects and interaction between these coverages. So now things was, nice thing was also that we get these interactions easily uh, here too. So, so if you um, if you look at this survival, uh, so this is just empirical kind of looking that when you get an um, event or sensor that whether the line drops or continues on the same level. And how much it drops then depends on the how many people you still have in the But from the survival, Kaplan-Meier survival curve, you can't actually compute the hazards out because of the it's discontinuous problem. Uh, so, and the, this was the end result made for doctors, so that when the patient comes, the doctor can look at that. Uh, okay, uh, there was no rupture. Tumor size was 10 centimeters, mitotic count 25. Oh, it's dark red. 
So there's 90 to 100 percent it's probability that uh, there's reoccurrence in next uh, three or five years. I can't remember which one. And and as you can see, the shape from the shapes uh, that it is is nonlinear. Uh, problem and this interaction between these different coverage. The white spaces here are for the cases where we don't have patients uh, and so that it's kind of not trying to extrapolate too much. It's, uh, the model is extrapolating a little but we didn't want to extrapolate too much. And based on feedback this is used by cancer doctors and they also saw it to patients which are of course very interested in their own uh, survival probability. And here's the ROC showing that these uh, three bottom lines are the previous rule-based approaches and these two upper lines are then these GP-based models, uh, there's just difference that one of them has extra coverage. So clear, clear improvement in the prediction accuracy. And of course, instead of this kind of just graph now used, we could have an online service giving uh, the more exact probability for each. And so this was in the Lancet Oncology. Uh, so in the previous example, it was already kind of personal information that what's your probability, but it didn't yet affect the treatment. Uh, in this other example, now there's also this treatment. And now we have also it's not just the information from, from the time of surgery. It's also we know whether they are right now eating the medication or how long time ago they stopped eating this medication. Uh, and then there's again this same uh, coverage, uh, the tumor mitotic count, tumor location uh, as previously. Uh, in this it was also complicated because now we had interval sensor data so they use uh, computer tomography scans to uh, try to find out if the tumor has reoccurred but uh, there was variation in interval between scannings so we know just that when they scan, that okay, uh, if, if it now shows in the scanning, that actually it reoccurred between some time interval. And this complicated little bit of uh, computation, but still we can use the GP approach. Now in a previous example, it was assumed that the shape of the hazard in time is same for everyone and just the coverage affects and the level. But now we assume also that the shape of the hazard is different for each person uh, because for example they eat different time this uh, medicine. But we can do then the joint model having the interaction between time and then the other coverage. Um, Again, we assume a piecewise of constant baseline hazard, but then in this case we also change to a simpler model, assuming discretized time. Uh, the number of events and suspectable people on given time interval with common coverage values can be modeled using Poisson binomial Bernoulli model and then with the Gaussian process on location parameter. And then which one of these to use depends on then just the kind of uh, the amount of counts and high high intensities that which one of these is then the most um, useful. 
so here's the result. So that now we get individual Hazard functions for each person. Of course, for each person, we have just one time for the event or censoring. So how it's possible that we still have for each the curve is that with the Gaussian process, we are saying that the prior for the, these functions is that similar people should have similar shape of the function. And we can also say that we assume that, that there's a similarity. What happens when they stop eating the medicine? So the similarity, how quickly it raises and then drops. And then there's also similarity between people still eating medicine and so on. And all these helps that we can actually get an individual uh, ASR functions. You can see here that there's the, most of them stopped eating it at one year or three years, but then there are some cases where they stopped eating it uh, between, probably because of the bad side effects of this medicine. So this medicine uh, has, for example, the causes chronic diarrhea. And some of the patients might at some point decide that they uh, prefer to take the chance of reoccurrence than living with uh, chronic diarrhea all the time. Uh, but you can see from this that the risk stays low as long as they are eating the medicine. And when they stop, the risk stops. So we can make personalized prediction, and th these are now like uh, six prototype persons that what if they would eat the medicine three years we know that as long as they eat the hazard stays low when they stop it jumps but it depends now on the back background information that how high it jumps and so it would be possible to give personal personalized advice that okay this person here, the risk doesn't increase so much. And he or she could stop eating the medicine uh, without a big increase in the risk. But then maybe this person should keep eating it uh, longer. What uh, was the uh, so it was the, this in the mitotic count. Uh, the nine, number of cell divisions in certain view. Um, and for each person, we can, at any time they visit uh, their doctor, it would be possible to have, again, then this online system where they could see what would be now the risk if I now stop eating medicine. Another reason for having these curves is that uh, this follow-up after surgery, it's based on the, the CT scans, which causes uh, radiation dosage, and then there's some uh, chemical also given the, this um, contrast, um, to improve the contrast, and uh, so we know that as long as they are eating, there's no need to have the CT scan so often. But when they stop eating, there should be CT scans more frequently because then sooner the reoccurrence is found out, then the better uh, the the prognosis is then again for the, these patients. So it's, it's better to find them the reoccurrence as soon as possible. Uh, so there was also in the paper the non-personalized part so that we computed. So there was uh, previously proposed protocols when to do scannings and based on then these prototype persons we, so that we can do also these 
um, optimized. So optimizing the time to detection based on these curves. But we could also do this for each person separately, that what would be the uh, good time for the next scanning. And this helps then reduce uh, the number of CT scans. So based on these prototype persons, approximately 30% percent it's less CT scans, which would reduce then the amount of radiation they get, and of course it's cheaper and so on. Okay. Uh, so that example was now the, the kind of the most advanced and most personalized I've done so far. Uh, I will also now briefly talk about these accelerated failure type, failure time models, where now the Hazard has, Hazard function has parametric form. Uh, there are some cases where there's so much uncertainty in the data, so much noise, so much variation that we don't learn so well these Hazard functions. In this case, it was, there was a lot of information we could learn quite quick changes in the shape. But sometimes there's not so much difference and we can use these parametric uh, forms on those cases. And it makes then the computation uh, slightly easier. But there was a nice example. This is actually old data I picked from internet, but I want to show it just because of good example again of the benefits of Gaussian processes uh, modeling the coverage effects. And there was smiled leukemia in adults. And the old way is to use linear model for the logarithm of uh, of these location parameter for these parametric functions like uh, for the Weibull model. Uh, this is what it would look like with that. But now if we instead use Gaussian processes, we see for example here that it's clearly nonlinear. And even so that, the, so this is a white blood cell count and we can see that, that there's some ideal value, but it's bad both that if it's too low or too high. While in the linear model, it's always just straight line, and so it couldn't see this effect here. Other thing is that with this uh, linear model used, linear models used interactions have to be defined explicitly. With the Gaussian process, it's again easy to use such uh, priors on functions that they are these interactions automatically involved. And what was interesting here was that if we now look at just females and the white blood cell counts, but now the uh, blue one is for people living in good areas, and red one is put for people living, or uh, the women living in uh, poor areas. And you can see that those people living in rich, good areas, they can have more variation in white blood cell counts before uh, the expected uh, survival time drops. So we might assume that they have different life habits or better treatments in those areas. But this was again something we could easily then find out with Gaussian processes. And so the benefits of also in, in these uh, cases when we use the parametric form for the Hazard function. Uh, this was in, in this space and data analysis book used as an example in the Gaussian processes chapter. Oops, old slide. It's been published two years ago. So I <laughs> um, 
So these were the main examples, and now this is the work in progress. So common problem in survival analysis is that uh, we have missing data. Uh, so that the, when we are doing this, making these models, we get information from these patients from some database, and it's quite likely that some of the information is missing from there, especially when we want to include more and more different coverage, uh, like we are working on uh, with these different lipid measurements, uh, growth hormone uh, values in blood, um, in the future, the genetic data and so on, it's quite likely that some of this information is missing. And then there are these methods for missing data imputation, but we can use also GPs here. And again, the benefit of then using GPs is that if there are nonlinear effects between these different coverages or interactions, we can then uh, handle those. Uh, it's of course not just restricted to GPs, but the framework we are now um, developing allows also uh, that, I mean, because the usual way to do the missing data imputation is so that you have to sample from these distributions for the missing data. And then you have a lot of samples and you have the, this multiple imputation framework. And so that you have to make your survival model for different uh, samples from the missing data distribution. But then we could use also um, distributional approximation for this uncertainty and propagate that uncertainty through our model and so we need to do only just one model um, for to get the predictions. Uh, these examples I showed, uh, I've used uh, the GP stuff, MATLAB, slash Octave uh, toolbox for them, and a computation was feasible. For generic use, uh, there's a challenge that um, when we get more data, the GP's uh, computation gets more challenging. And so what, what means more data? If we have these uh, parametric observation models, then the n is just the number of patients. But then if we have this non-parametric form for the hazard in time, and then we discretize the time, then we actually have the, the number of observations is the number of unique patients times the discrete time, time points where we still have people left in the study. And that can be large, that number. And so we um, need to think about, uh, take care of that. So the simple approach, which was used in all those examples I showed, it can scale at least to so it, um, like 10,000 observations easily. Then there are approximations which now varies that it's possible that we could go up to millions of observations now. That uh, no one has done it for survival models. And so this is work in progress. Uh, the non gaussianity adds extra, extra computation needed there based on Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, Laplace approximation, expectation propagation, variational bias, and so on. Um, and so, um, what I want to say is that there are already kind of many cases where you can use these. But I can't guarantee that if you would like to use for your own survival analysis case that the software we already have could handle that. 
Um, uh, in the future, I'm using these approaches so that we have a collaboration with Helsinki and Uusimaa Hospital District. Uh, there's, for example, the chronic obst obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, where we have a lot of information from these patients. Uh, GP stuff is this toolbox for MATLAB and Octave, uh, which was used for these examples and which can handle similar examples and, uh, and also is able to handle bigger data sets because we didn't use all the uh, best approximation on those cases because the simple approach was enough. Uh, some code available in GPy, so Neil can, Neil knows more what's currently there, but the uh, ongoing work, uh, uh, so I'm also now involved uh, getting survival analysis models to GPy. So a lot of these uh, that kind of there's a problem in research that we can get funding for developing new methods. We implement them with the language which is most familiar for us, or maybe you are lucky and you get a student who does the work for you and then you change the language because of that, uh, like happened with GPy. Um, and so now the stand would be kind of nice to have all these methods there because it has then interfaces in R, Python, Julia, MATLAB, uh, Stata. So it would be uh, possible to for a wider audience. But then we of course have a problem that where we get the resources to implement all these. Uh, we have now some funding for that and we are working on getting uh, these methods also in Stan. Uh, but then there's uh, again some of these Gaussian process things. They work fast enough only if using certain distributional approximations and so on which are not yet in Stan but uh, coming there uh, at, with in some time. And the last slide, so the take home messages from this talk is that we can use GPs to improve survival models. Of course, it's still useful to also make the old fashioned base as a baseline to check. Uh, and that we can use, we don't need to discretize continuous variables. We can mix continuous and discrete values, have nonlinear functions, interactions, uh, computation feasible already for many data sets, various software tools available, so it's quite likely that at least some of your problems could be uh, easily solved with GPs. But then it's, the problem is that I can't guarantee that it would work for all of your uh, problems. And we are working hard to make this all this easier so it would be uh, more kind of standard ways to make these uh, analysis. Thank you.